participated in the DXL storm experiment, which launched the first lobster eye optics into space. After GSFC, he spent time at SSL Berkeley before moving to Boston University, where he is currently a faculty member in the mechanical engineering department. He currently leads and is participating in several missions using soft, soft X-ray, lobster eye optics, including Cupid and Lexi. And today he will be discussing these observations in or soft X-ray imaging for space physicists. Brian. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Is my, my audio okay, Kyle? Yeah, it's good on my side. All right, fantastic. All right. So before jumping in, I'd just like to thank a number of folks that contributed to this, that will be presenting material and, and ideas from a number of people. And so I've got a number of names there, Michael Collier, Steve Sembe, uh, Massimiliano Galazzi, Kip Kunz, uh, Nick Thomas, Emil, and Kat all contributed great part for the talk today. So before diving in as well, we'd like to identify what we will be talking about today. So X-rays have been studied for uh, almost 100 years now in space. And the effort to study X-rays for magnetospheric physics and for space physics is not nearly as long as that 100 year history. Uh, for space physics, it's closer to 30 years. And so the material that we're gonna be talking today, we'll talk a little bit about the history, but the primary focus will be on using these photons, using these soft X-rays for space physics research. All right, so here's our agenda. We'll talk a bit about X-ray generation and history. We'll move on to science applications, spend a bit of time or quite a bit of time on instrumentation about different tools to do it, different optics and sensors. And then we'll spend a bit of time talking about current and upcoming missions. And we'll start at the top. We'll start about generation history. Uh, before doing so though, we'll, we'll talk about the basics of, of light and photons that we're going to be looking at. This is a nice plot here. The, there are two different y-axis on the left. We have fraction of atmosphere, and this is based upon a photon coming from space. So near the top, it doesn't go through much of the atmosphere at all. But once you get to the Earth, you've gone through one. You've gone through the full atmosphere. On the right, you've got altitude. And on the bottom and top, you've got different wavelength bands. <clears throat> so we have a whole bunch of different bands. The band we'll be talking primarily about today is, is right here between 50 to 100 EV electron volts and 3 keV. And as you can see here, this black trace in the background here shows uh, how far different photons can travel through the atmosphere. And you can see it's pretty high up for this wavelength, which means that we can't see it from the Earth. So all of the observations that we will want to do for these soft X-rays will need to be from space-borne applications. So from sounding rockets, from satellites and others. Another thing I want to mention here, if you hear the word x-ray, most people before, and if you went out and talked to someone on the street and said, you ever heard about x-rays, most people will say yes, but it will be because of medical applications. So in comparison to what we're talking about today, a, a medical application x-ray is somewhere on the order of 20 to 50 keV. And so it's uh, about an order of magnitude higher energy than the x-rays that we're going to be using for observing we'll be talking about. All right. So going back to the history of this, where does this application or where does this come from? And most of this starts from the ROSAT satellite. And this was operational in the, the 1990s, it was launched in 1990. It was in low earth orbit. So you can see a plot of the earth and roughly the orbit here on the right in dashed or dotted lines. And you can see it's fairly, the orbit is fairly close to the terminator. And so it would look out radially outward from the earth and it would look in its objectives was to measure a number of features of the soft X-ray uh, background or the, the soft x-ray contribution from the local galaxy. And it went up, one of the very first things it did was create an all-sky survey. And these are some of the results. Uh, this is the quarter keV band from ROSAT, the ROSAT all-sky survey. And the first measurements that came back looked a lot like the top plot here. And here, in, this is an all-sky map. The far red and white are very intense and on black and purple are, are less intense. And you can see a number of features that one would expect, but some features that are not quite expected as well. So the local bubble is thought to be somewhat uh, oblong, oblique, oblate, uh, not using the right word, elongated in one direction. 
And so because of that, you're gonna have a longer path length uh, at the top and bottom. So you get more emission, this is somewhat expected. But these streaks that you see going across, these are uh, corresponding to different orbits. And an orbit for a low earth orbiting spacecraft is on the order of 90 minutes. And so this is strange that you see a streak and then one orbit or two orbits later, you don't see a streak because this means something is changing on time scales of 90 minutes ish. And this isn't really commensurate with what we expect from a lot of these types of things. So there was a way to clean it. Uh, this is some work by Snowden and, and colleagues and the bottom plot is cleaned of those what are later to be called long-term enhancements. But this was a curiosity. This was a problem at the time that there's some amount of emission x-ray emission that was not accounted for, that it doesn't meet the models. And so let's look a little bit further. Another big discovery, another big outcome came from uh, a pointed observation from ROSAT at a comet. And comets are icy balls of, of rock and ice. And so they're not very hot. We expect very energetic and hot things to have lots of x-rays. This was extremely bright in x-rays. And so that, there's another curiosity there. In this picture, the nucleus of the comet is the, the cross, and then there's a big bright region on the sunward side. And uh, also you can see the motion of the comet here. And so this led to some uh, interesting ideas and a number of great hypotheses. And one was that a process called charge exchange is producing this. And a lot of people in space physics have heard of charge exchange. They think often the production of ENA, but you can have charge exchange that produce many different things. And so we will step forward here and talk a little bit more about this particular charge exchange that could cause x-rays. So here we have a cartoon. We have a, a two-step process. Uh, first, you have a high charge state ion. We've got oxygen here, but it could be something else. It meets or interacts with a neutral. Here we've got hydrogen, but it could be helium. It could be something else again. In that interaction, it, it takes an electron from the neutral. And that electron, when it's first taken, is in an excited state. As it relaxes, as it drops from that excited state, it will typically emit a photon in the soft X-ray band. So this is a, a great interaction here. And actually, you can get multiple photons from one interaction. That uh, electron could relax several times, or you can get multiple photons coming out from just one interaction. This is a cartoon of this picture, but we can write a little bit more of the equation and what we'd expect to observe. A sample interaction, again, is shown um, in, in black here in that white box. And we typically get x-rays between 1 and, and 2.1 and 2 keV. If you were a, a clever or carefully listening person, you might think, well, you said oxygen, but maybe there are other molecules or atoms. And maybe there are other charge states. All of these are going to have different lines based upon the transition. And so we've drawn 0.1 to 2 keV. There, there's lots of lines. So we'll look at those in a moment. The next element is that this is a, a signal. This is an integrated signal. And so whatever is in the way, we're going to observe. And so we have a line integral here and the ingredients that you want for bright emissions are shown. You'd like lots of neutrals. If there's lots of neutrals, you can have lots of interactions. We'd like lots of solar wind plasma as well. That's NSW, that's density of solar wind plasma. The more of both of those ingredients, the more likely it is we get charge exchange. We have this relative velocity, V rel. This gives us the um, collisional frequency if we know how quickly they're moving. Uh, the sigma is uh, collisional cross sections, and then we have a couple of um, constants in there. So you can kind of see that the ingredients that you need to get more emissions, and that will be important later. So we go back to our spacecraft here, or the ROSAT spacecraft. This is a multi-fluid MHD model. The color is showing density. The sun is off to the left and overlaid on top of that. Uh, so we're only showing solar wind density here. Overlaid on top of that is our neutral model, and so we'll do that here. And so you can see regions where there's lots of overlap. And so those regions of overlap, you expect more x-rays. So we'll now we'll draw ROSAT and we can put together what we think might be happening. ROSAT again was in low earth orbit. And to look out at the local galaxy, it's got to look through the magneto sheath. And we see the magneto sheath is fairly dense in solar wind plasma. And so that's one possible contaminant or one possible source of these additional x-rays. Another source is just the heliosphere that our solar system has neutrals. These neutrals come in through the interstellar medium. The densities are much lower. The density in the solar wind is lower of plasma, but the path lengths are very, very long. And so you can get some contribution as well just through the heliosphere, particularly in areas like the helium focusing cone. So if you think this is what's going on, if you think the magnetosphere is a significant contributor, you can have a prediction. 
the prediction is that when the solar wind flux or there's lots of density and material in the solar wind, we should see more soft x-rays, just like that equation told us from the previous slide. So we can check that, and authors did. And this is one of the, the first studies looking at this by Cravens and, and colleagues, and the x-axis is time, the y-axis is parameter with red being the ROSAT background and, sorry, green being the ROSAT background and red being the solar wind flux. You can see they go up and down with very similar trends. And so this was a, a, a big landmark event when people all started gathering and understanding that these emissions actually can be coming from solar wind charge exchange. Okay, where do these lines come from? Where do these photons come from? And this, this is an ongoing area of research right now. Um, the x-axis here is energy and the y-axis is line strength. And there's lots and lots of lines here. Uh, this is a, a figure from Kunz et al. And, and there are different charge states, different ions, and, and all of these are, are challenging and hard to differentiate all of them. Some of them are known well. Some of them are not known well, that the collisional cross sections are um, things that we're still researching as a community. So the reason we put this up here is that the solar wind itself, uh, a clever space physicist might be thinking about this and thinking, wait a minute, heavy ions, we don't have any of those. And that's true. The solar wind is majority hydrogen, about 95%. Uh, on a typical day, three to 4% alpha particles or fully ionized helium, and just a couple of percent or 1% even of heavy ions. So there's not a lot of them, but there are enough. We've certainly observed them a number of times or regularly with ROSAT, as well as a number of times with other spacecraft. So the point showing here is that there are a whole bunch of them. And so one could study them. You could do spectroscopy and learn very interesting things about the composition of the solar wind, or you could just integrate over all of them and say, I, I'm just, I just care about the solar wind. Where is it and where are the gradients? And you could do that as well. And so I'll show another slide here. This is an actual measurement. The previous slide was, was theory. Here the X axis is energy and the Y axis is counts. And you can see there's a whole bunch of different lines. And so this is just an experimental demonstration that you really can learn quite a bit about the solar wind and the spectral composition and high charge state composition from looking at the soft X-ray spectra. Another interesting thing here is that there's a lot of them and the resolution isn't um, as, as desirable as we'd like. We'd like more resolution. We'd like to see even more of these lines. And the, the instrumentation is really fantastic what's being flown, but we, we need to figure out ways to get even more of these lines so we can separate these. All right, so we pointed out where these could be observed. We talked about this one example with ROSAT, but since then there have been many, many studies of people that have looked for this charge exchange. And the first place people have looked is the magneto sheath. As we said, the solar wind density in the magneto sheath is, is high. And so you can have lots of, um, um, lots of observations through there and a number of spacecraft, the uh, XMM Newton spacecraft, as well as the Chandra spacecraft, as well as a few others. Um, Suzaku have been used to look for this emission and, and lots of people have seen it, have done different types of studies. The bottom right is showing a, a longer term study using the quarter KEV band on ROSAT again. The x-axis is solar wind flux, so from a solar wind monitor, and the y-axis is charge exchange counts um, from ROSAT. And one could look at this and say, okay, there's a reasonable trend, but there is a bit of scatter. And actually the authors of this paper were, were fairly clever and they thought about this and they said, well, if ROSAT is looking out, it's gonna be looking through different thicknesses of the magneto sheath. And if you look through a very thick path through the magneto sheath, you're gonna get more emissions than if you look through a very thin path. And so these dotted lines that are highlighted here with the arrows are showing just that. If you were um, looking at these different thickness paths, these different lengths, you're gonna get this, you'd expect this amount of scatter. And so it, it looks fairly consistent with what the authors would predict. So this is fairly comforting if you're trying to use these things to study uh, magnetospheric dynamics. So we can step forward. There's, there's plenty of other places pretty much everywhere we've looked that we'd expect to see solar wind charge exchange. Authors have. Uh, there, at this point, just one observation of the cusp using the Suzaku spacecraft. Uh, and there are plenty of observations of different planetary bodies from Mars to Venus to the moon and even others as well. All right, so this is a bit of discussion about our generation and history. At this point, we'll make a little bit of a transition and talk about science application before we talk about how we observe it, which is a little bit different than some of the optical tools we've learned about in the past. All right, this is the plot that we had shown before, as well as the equation we had shown. And we can look at the ingredients and figure out where we get sharp gradients in soft x-rays. 
So sharp, ingredient, sharp gradients will be when we have a lot of these ingredients. And I'm looking out here, the day side, the nose of the magnetopause, we get nice dense solar wind plasma in the sheath, but a sharp gradient when you cross into the magnetosphere. So that's one possible region. Another great, good region is the magnetosphere cusp. So I'm pointing to my cursor here, hopefully that's visible. These cusps are regions where there's very high neutral density because we're close to the earth and you still get a fair amount of penetration of solar wind plasma as well. So these are two excellent places to look if you'd wanna study the magnetosphere by using this tool of soft x-rays. All right, there's lots of plots here. And so we're gonna talk about it slowly. The way you would look at this, the way you would read this is similar to how you would read words on a page. We're gonna start in the top left and we're gonna end in the bottom right. So in any type of emission, whether you're talking about ENAs or soft X-rays or any other photons you observe, before deciding you want to build a spacecraft or build an observing system, you need to model it and prove to yourself that the signal to noise is sufficient to study the processes, the physical processes that you're interested in. And so that's what this is showing here. The top left is an idealized plot. This is using soft, um, sorry, an MHD model as well as a neutral model to predict where you might get soft X-rays. Uh, in this picture, the sun is to the top, and so the outer curve you see is the bow shock. The inner curve is the magnetopause. Next, you would take that, you would add the soft x-ray background, the galaxy itself, the local bubble are going to contribute, and so we want to add those elements. We put those together, and you get to the top, the end of the top row. Uh, after that, we, we need to convolve this to a point spread function. Any optic we use will have a point spread function, so we need to apply that to the photons to uh, smear the, the image a little bit. So you get that on the total, the second row, the right column now shows that convolved image. We add a vignetting function based upon the field of view and the detector that we might use. You get the image shown on the right. Now we're going to add some instrumental effects. We get image to the right. And on the bottom, we add some Poisson noise as we might expect, and you can see a picture there. All right. So at this point, it's also important to point out another difference in soft X-ray imaging compared to other types of imaging you might be familiar with or other folks might be familiar with. Uh, I do a little bit of amateur photography and, and interact with other people. And a common thing to do is you look at your target, your like to photograph, and you can change your integration time. Maybe you want to image something at night. It's very faint. You want to integrate for a number of seconds, maybe even a number of minutes. That's not how soft X-ray imaging works. It is imaging, they're both imaging, but the counts are so low that you don't need to do that integration. And so here I've, I've crossed off in-space integration and are, are calling it event-based observing. So for people that are familiar with different types of space physics types instruments, this is almost more consistent with uh, an energetic particle detector that counts every single, or that has the ability to count every single particle that comes down and bring that information to, this, to the ground from the spacecraft. That's what's going on here. And so there's great benefits to that, actually. The counts are small enough that you can time tag and position tag everything. And a great benefit of that is if it's not integrated on the spacecraft, if you can pick and choose your time integrals on the ground, you can pick uh, your pixel size. You can put them anywhere you want. You can pick your different shapes as well. And so that's an example of this. Is, it's labeled creative binning. And uh, a user took this image, the one on the bottom left, and said, that's interesting, but we know a little bit about the magnetopause shape. And so we can make long, narrow pixels based upon an integration on the ground. And that's fair game. You can do that. You can separate the way the photons are coming in, I'm sorry, not coming in, how they're distributed in the plots. And that's a really important feature of soft X-ray imaging that the counts are sufficiently low that you can bring down every single photon. You don't need to integrate on the spacecraft. All right, when you look at this as well, you wanna be quantitative. We don't wanna just looking at things and saying, I, I think it moves, I think I see a feature. We, we wanna be quantitative, we're, we're scientists and engineers here. And so on the left is a plot of just that. This is a very, very simple example of how you could do that. Here, uh, researchers took a, a trace, a, just a vertical trace and said, if we did that, what do the counts look like as a function of space? And that's shown as the red trace here. And they said, well, what if we just took derivatives of this line? Maybe we smoothed a little bit and we took derivatives. And the derivatives actually do a very good job showing you where the boundary should be. You can see a very sharp boundary that's about where the magnetopause is. And uh, the next boundary here, or the next curve shift is about where the bow shock is. So that, that's very useful. And this, again, as I mentioned, is a very simple way of doing it. There have been many more sophisticated models. And I would point folks to some of the references shown here of Collier and Connor or 
um, Anders Jorgensen or Tanner and Son and, and colleagues that they've done some really sophisticated and fantastic work um, identifying different ways to pick out these boundaries from these types of images. So as we step forward a little bit, we haven't talked much about science. What could you do if you could image this? And it's really a different category of understanding from what we've been able to do in the past. We've had things like MMS that have done fantastic multi, um, sorry, fantastic micro scale physics understanding and really uh, pushed the envelope and pushed the community forward about understanding of reconnection. But with this, we haven't really gotten a very good understanding of the macro scale picture. We know that reconnection occurs on small kind of tens of kilometer scales, but how do those field lines unfold? What does that do in terms of depositing energy into the magnetosphere? We can't get a good idea from these really micro scale pictures. There are other tools that we'd like to use like uh, ground-based imaging and radar, uh, but this is a really fantastic tool as well if we can get the macro scale picture. And so one way we can study this is just by looking at how the subsolar point moves as a function of time. And that's what the x-axis is showing here. The y-axis is just showing the subsolar magnetopause position. And, and very quickly, and just looking at a couple of measurements, we could learn a lot about how reconnection works and how flux is being snipped off the magnetosphere. And, and there's two different models shown here. One is reconnection could be occurring continuously and slowly eroding the boundary by um, eroding flux or by decreasing the magnetic field. And so it would move inward, but alternatively, it could be a flux transfer model when you're actually snipping off uh, magnetic flux, which would be moving the boundary inward in jumps and leaps. And so you can see that here. Uh, typically, the, the time cadence for this type of imaging is on the order of five minutes, but you can do a little bit better if you've got strong solar wind flux. And so the duration of the steps here is something that could be indeed resolved from uh, soft X-ray imaging, as well as the Y-axis, the steps of how much the magnetopause is leaping inward as a function of time. Another thing we could study is the, the global change of the magnetosphere. An ongoing topic for the past couple of decades is something called polar cap saturation. And the idea here is that if we have a small amount of southward BZ, we might get reconnection at the dayside magnetopause. And if that increases, we get stronger and stronger southward IMF. We get more and more reconnection and driving of convection electric fields and polar cap saturation um, potential. But eventually it stops, it slows. That the solar wind can keep driving harder and harder, but we don't get more polar cap potential. And so there's some understanding that we don't have quite yet. Why does the magnetopause stop? What's going on there? We don't know. There's been a whole bunch of theories proposed, uh, but we, we haven't been able to understand this. And, and we, were, we would be able to understand it quite quickly, actually, with just a few global images and soft x-rays. And here's a picture from an MHD model from Cisco and company. And this group uh, was looking at the uh, the global shape of the magnetopause and said, well, if the magnetopause and the magnetosphere change shape, it could divert flow around it and you get less material coming in to reconnect and therefore it would just slow as possible. But we don't know, we haven't been able to image this. We've got point measurements from spacecraft, but no global images. Another thing you could study is a global impact or even impact from large kinetic structures upstream. So here in this picture, the sun is off to the left. This is a hybrid model from Omidy and company. And you see these large structures on the bow shock. That's this outer boundary here in vibrant red and blue colors. And these are not predicted in MHD models at all, but we see them as large and dramatic structures in kinetic models. And so these are large kinetic structures that form at the shock and in the sheath. And these things slam into the magnetopause and they, they we know and small scale, they cause reconnection, they cause large indentations, but what they do on the large scale, we don't know. We've never been able to image it. We've just got a couple of uh, point measurements from spacecraft for a series of spacecraft. Another feature of this that ties in just to that topic above is you get radiation belt shadowing. We know when the magnetopause gets pushed or compressed inward, you're gonna lose particles in the radiation belt. They'll drift outward. Well, what if you get a, a strong spatially localized compression from a hot flow anomaly or a big kinetic structure? Will that decrease our radiation belt? We don't know very well. And these are types of things, but if we know where the magnetopause is, we can know how much, or we can model how much will be lost. So those are things that would be fantastic to do and just a couple of soft X-ray images on the global scale could do it. All right, another area we could study are the cusps. We talked about the magnetopause and the cusp. On the right here, we're showing a couple pictures of the cusp and different features that go on. Here, the sun is on the left. The gray traces are the magnetospheric field lines. And the red one is newly reconnected and it's being pulled from the left to the right. 
And when it reconnects, lots of plasma starts flowing along it from the solar wind. So this is the solar wind plasma that we're interested in. Um, high density is on the equatorward edge and lower density on the poleward edge. Same thing with energy. The fast moving ones get into the cusp first. The slower moving ones get to the cusp second. And so on the left is a spacecraft measurement of this. This is from the cluster spacecraft. And you can see exactly what you'd predict. The y-axis is energy in the top panel with time on the x-axis and you start high energy and then down to low energy. And you see something similar in density, big peak, and then slowly decaying with time. So this is a, a, a typical and classic example of a single reconnecting line that we would see. And lots of spacecraft have seen this through the cusp. However, this is not what's always seen. Some other things can be seen. We'll show another plot here. Sometimes it's a lot messier. And the top panel is showing this, the spectra, and then you've got these density peak going up and down. So this is confusing and could have multiple physical explanations. One is that there are multiple points of reconnection going on all at the same time, discontinuous. Another thing could be that reconnection turning on and off temporally. And there's been lots of papers and lots of studies supporting either one of those arguments. We don't have a good idea of this, but if we could image the cusp from the bottom looking up, we could solve this pretty quickly. Uh, this is a, a model image, what we think we'd be able to observe from the cusp with the, the Cupid spacecraft that we'll talk about. And this is again, a, a single ion dispersion. There's no splits in local time, uh, but there, as you can see, there is significant counts or sufficient counts to really study these things. And you can study types of questions like is reconnection spatially patchy or continuous or um, is reconnection temporally intermittent or steady? And there's been lots of measurements from different realms making argument of either one of those. Okay, so these are the things that we'd like to study. The next question is how do we do this? How do we study it? And the first thing to point out is that it's different. It's different from a lot of the optics that we've worked with or other folks have worked with in the past because of the energy People in the audience right now might be wearing optics on your head. You could be wearing glasses or contact lenses. Those use a different type of, of focusing than you need to use for soft x-rays. And so we'll talk about the differences. All right, so here is a, a diagram you could draw. The first photon we're gonna say is this one incident here. It's moving from the bottom left to top right. Maybe you're traveling through vacuum and you reach a medium. When you reach that medium, there's two choices or three choices, I guess. One is you could be refracted as you pass through. Another is you could be reflected. And the third choice is you could be absorbed. So you could have those three different options for that one photon. And the choice or the process that's taken is based upon the energy of the photon and the material that we're interacting with. So we've, we're not gonna go through all of the derivations here, but I'll touch on a couple of the main points and the highlights below. So the first one is that, the index of refraction, n, uh, is, is roughly 1 minus delta plus i beta, where delta and beta are optical constants. And in general, they're much larger than 1 for x-ray ap applications. And i is the imaginary number, so that's the imaginary component. So if you take this, if you take the indexes of refraction in a vacuum and medium, and you come in at you, a certain angle, this um, angle theta sub i, and you go through Snell's laws and a couple of other um, approximations, you can get roughly the equation shown in, in part b here that there exists some critical angle, and that critical angle is proportional or roughly um, the square root of z, which is your atomic number of the medium or the material divided by e, the energy. Okay, so we take a step further down here to point c if your theta i, your incident angle, is less than your critical angle theta sub c, the photon is reflected. Uh, alternatively, if, if your incident angle is greater than that, it will likely be absorbed, uh, either absorbed or just pass right through the medium. And so you're not gonna get any reflection. And so that kind of tells us what we have to be doing here. Uh, part D is giving us a little bit more if we plugged in some numbers and actually calculated what these angles we need are. And it's kind of between 0.5 and one. So about a degree for photons in the 0.1 to 10 keV range. And so this tells us we need to be reflecting and we need to be reflecting at very low angles. And so this is grazing incidence reflection. So all of the optical methods that we'll talk about rely on this grazing incident reflections. We can't pass through the medium. Um, we can't bounce off like a large mirror. We need to use grazing incident reflections. Uh, the first one we'll talk about are Walter type optics. Uh, there's a, a couple of different Walter type optics. There was a seminal paper in the 1950s that outlines them. There's, uh, 
uh, some really good work described in it. So I'd recommend people look out if they're interested in that. The most commonly used one for X-ray focusing is Walter One. Uh, this is pretty good because it has the largest aperture to focal length ratio. And so it's particularly useful for these types of applications. And the way this works is you, you have X-ray photons coming in from the right. As they enter, they're gonna bounce off two different surfaces. One's parabolic, one's hyperbolic. And after it bounces off these at low angles, it reaches a focal point. And that focal point is where you can image. This is good, but this is not a, a, focal, a focusing system. You need to make something a little bit more sophisticated here. And so what people do is you can take this shape and just make a shell. Imagine rotating it cylindrically and so you make a shell. That's good, but we want more photons collected and so you need lots of shells. So these are two examples of it. On the right is from Astro H. This is 203 nested shells. You can imagine how challenging that was to assemble all these very carefully assembled and very carefully coded shells that are put together. And on the left, you can see another one with a human in, in the foreground or in the background there, so you can get a, a rough idea. This is from XMM Newton. And a, a benefit and an advantage of this type of focusing system is you get really great point spread function, which means you can really focus very tightly your photons coming in. All right, so the, a challenge though with that previous, I guess we'll take a step back here. A challenge is that you've got all these nested arrays and so it can get fairly heavy. And so if you try to put these on a spacecraft, we often try to keep things light. <clears throat> it's challenging to do that with this type of system. Another advancement that's, I'll, I'll say ongoing now and making really great headways, uh, a similar type of structure, but instead of these large nested shells, we're, they're using a dry etched uh, silicon wafer here. And so these are two plots from um, some work by Tokyo Metropolitan University. And there's two etched wafers. You can see the top stage on the top or the first stage and then the second stage. And you can see in the cartoon in the bottom left, that if you put these together, you can focus light using this Walter type optics. And so this is a, I think a developing area and hasn't quite realized all of the benefits yet. So we haven't been able to realize the full point spread function that you might be able to see from this type of focusing system, but I, I think there'll be great progress in the near future from this. Another type of focusing system is called a lobster eye system. And we've got a picture of a lobster here. If you zoomed in on its eye, you see these small little square pores. And there is a difference between how lobster eyes work and how human eyes work. Our eyes work through refraction, so it's gonna bend light as it travels through. Lobsters use these little pores and they collect light through reflection and they collect it all and they can bring it to one focus, focusing, focusing point and they can um, uh, get their vision through this method. So this is what we're going to adopt or what groups have adopted to look through lobster eye optics. All right, so this is something called a, a KB or Kirkpatrick bias uh, approximation. If you have a photon coming from the right and you bounce this off two perpendicular surfaces, you can focus the x-rays. Again, we can't escape this limitation of it's gotta be low angles, it's gotta be grazing incidents. So this is one cartoon here, but you need lots of them. If you apply lots of them, you can get uh, a much larger amount of photons coming in or a larger grasp. And this is a, a manifestation of this. And I, I give credit to the University of Leicester and Photonics. They've done a huge amount of great work developing things over the years, over uh, 20 years or more doing this. And so on the left here is an actual image of one of these micropore optics. It looks just like a square piece of glass. It's uh, quite a bit more sophisticated than that, but on a bench, it looks like that with a small radius of, sorry, a large radius of curvature. The actual glass plate has lots of little holes. If you zoomed in on it, you could see them on the right. And the whole thing is curved. The whole thing is slumped. It's slumped uh, with a certain radius of curvature. And the focal length will be one half that radius of curvature. <clears throat> so there's been some great progress as well recently with those. The first set of them flew on a sounding rocket flight in 2012 and 2014. There's actually a number of them on, on their way to Mercury right now from on the Bepi Colombo mission. So that's another um, fun application of this and, and some good results. So what can it do? There is an interesting point spread function from this. And as we mentioned before, any optic will have a point spread function. And so on the left is showing a simulation of photons coming in. As we said, it was spherically uh, shaped, this optic, it was bent over a spherical surface. And so if you see the photons coming in, they can get focus. And on the right is your point spread function. Uh, the middle is the central focus. That's where we want all our photons to be. Not all of the photons get there. Some of them, uh, if you look at it very carefully, you'd see, well, there are open holes. Some photons will just zip right through and won't bounce off a face. 
That's correct. And that's what you see in this point spread function too. Some of the, um, some of the counts that are just patches that don't go into the center are photons that just go straight through. And the ones that make up the arms are singly reflected, so they don't get on two faces. They're not focused to the center. And this is just a feature of this type of optical system. Observations are very close. On the right is ray tracing simulation. On the left are observations, and, and that's great. That's uh, a very similar cross. The bulk of the counts are again are in the middle, but you see these arms, these beautiful arms, as well as some photons that go straight through. A limitation of this technique is the resolution. <clears throat> and the resolution is based upon here, typically by the point spread function. You can't necessarily realize the full resolution of, a <clears throat> of an optical system. And so we're, we're roughly bound by about 2.2 degrees or 10 arc minutes or so. A benefit, however, of this is that you can get a much larger field of view than you can typically from Walter type optics. So some of the missions that people are organizing right now have a larger field of view of 10 to 100 times larger than um, traditional Walter type optics. So there's certainly trade-offs between the two. And this is a fun plot here. Sometimes people look at these crosses and they think, well, what can you actually get out of this? This is a, a fun simulation of using this word hello and photons passing through and you push it, put it through the point spread function you get on the right there. That you can indeed see these uh, the words, but some of the photons get spread out a little bit because of the PSF, the point spread function. All right, detectors. So we'll talk a little bit about detectors and then we'll talk about future missions. There's a number of ways to observe x-rays that people have used. So the first one we'll talk about is a proportional counter. And for individuals with backgrounds in the space physics community, you've probably heard of a Geiger counter. This is very similar to a Geiger counter. You've got a chamber filled with gas that's shown on the cartoon on the top right. And inside that chamber is a, a conducting um, part, and that's usually um, charged to a high voltage. As radiation comes through that chamber, whether it's a particle or a photon, it ionizes some of that gas in the chamber. And that ionized gas is attracted to the anode in the middle, that charged conductive piece in the middle. Um, in this particular application, it can pass through, it can slam into other uh, molecules in that gas or other atoms, and it can cause more and more ionization, and they all get attracted to the anode in the middle. And then that signal on the anode is a, a, a measurement or is proportional to the energy of the photon that came through. Uh, we have a picture of an implementation of this on the left. This is from the DXL sounding rocket. It's flown a number of times, had some fantastic results as well. Uh, a feature of this or an advantage of this, is it's fairly simple. It's been a, a real workhorse for X-ray astronomy for a number of years. There's some great papers by the Wisconsin group, and we've got one cited here of some really great work in the 1980s of all sky surveys, even from a series of sounding rockets. Another great thing is you can get a large collecting area. These can be very big. That's a human hand on the left there, and you can see these big proportional counters. So you can get some really great um, collecting area, which can allow you to get sm small signals. You can also get spectral information, which is great. Okay, another tool that's often used is a, a microchannel plate or an MCP. People in the space physics community often hear of these and think of these from plasma, plasma instruments. And it's a, a very similar uh, application of this sensor. The way it works is you've got a, a structure with a number of channels through it or pores. Here they look like they pass straight down, but oftentimes they're at a slight angle. Um, on the right is a zoom in of one of those pores. You bias the instrument, and so there's a high voltage across it. And as a photon or particle travels through, it bounces into a number of faces. As it does that, it causes a, a cloud of electrons or a number of electrons to be um, liberated from the side and they all pass through and creates a signal on the, the backside hitting your anode board. And the voltage across it helps encourage the electrons to pass through. Here are some actual manifestations of this or actual applications of this. There's some cartoons here. Oftentimes we have um, foil, not foils, um, grids on the top and bottom to apply your high voltage in your ground to encourage the, or to sweep the particles through. So this is gonna pass through. Uh, ultimately you need some position sensing as well if you wanna do some imaging here. And so this is a, a technique called wedge and strip. Um, you can look at the different elements in there. The wedges are the, um, vertical bars. You can see they're very narrow on the left and thick on the right. And, or sorry, those are the strips. And so depending upon where it strikes, you're gonna get a different signal. If it's a very thin one, you get a small signal, a very thick one, a larger signal. So that allows you to figure out if you're moving left or right. And the shape of the wedges allows you to figure out if you're top or bottom. Another feature of this, or another, man, another uh, application here, sometimes people use a delay line anode as well. That just uses different times um, for the signal to go from wherever it struck the anode board to your um, controlling electronics. 
Some advantages of this, it's got some great quantum efficiency, the QE, particularly with things like potassium bromide or cesium iodide coating, you can get good position sensing. And another great thing that people are excited about are uh, driving some missions that you have fairly low resources. There are no consumables, you don't need to cool it. It can operate as is, as long as you're in a nice vacuum and can support the high voltage. All right, the last one we'll mention is a CCD. I, I won't talk about this as much because I think a lot of people are familiar with CCDs that some, some phones have CCDs or CMOS cameras as well as a number of other applications in astronomy and astrophysics and even in commercial cameras that we own. Some advantages of this is you can get really great quantum efficiency. Again, good position sensing similar to the MCP. A benefit of this that you can't get from an MCP or micro channel plate is you can get spectral information, which is really great. Uh, there are many other ways of measuring x-rays. I, I will just highlight these three as ones that are commonly used or discussed for imaging magnetospheric um, missions, but other things like microcalorimeters are, are very prominent in, in the, the x-ray community as well. Okay, so these, these were our, our instrumentation tools, how we're going to measure it, and we'll talk about a couple of upcoming missions in the, the final five or ten minutes we have here. And again, I will add the caveat that we're going to be talking about magnetospheric missions. So there are plenty of missions that people are launching for other applications and setting some really fantastic questions in astrophysics, but we're going to be focusing here in the time we have remaining on just magnetospheric missions. So the first one up on the launch pad is Cupid. This is the cusp plasma imaging detector, Cupid CubeSat Observatory. It's being developed by Boston University. Right now it's being, or it's scheduled to launch in fall 2021. This is a CubeSat, a 6U CubeSat with a low earth orbit. 550 kilometers in a sun sink, 97.8 uh, degree inclination. It has one micropore optic. So the field of view is relatively small, four and a half by four and a half degrees, focal length of 27 and a half. And the science target is the cusp. It will look up and observe the cusp from low altitudes. This is a CAD model of the spacecraft. There's lots of things labeled here. We won't touch on all of them, but we'll talk a little bit about the telescope because that's what we'll be learning about today. This is an image of the telescope as built. The top we'll start at is where the photons come through. So a photon will pass through. First, we have a sunshade that keeps off axis light from the sun and earth and other things from reaching the optic. The next thing that it passes through is the optic itself. After the photon passes through the optic, it goes something called the sweeping magnets. And the reason we have sweeping magnets is because our MCP, the detector at the bottom here, is sensitive to photons, but it's also sensitive to charged particles. People use these detectors for plasma instruments all the time, and we don't want that. We only want photons. And so to keep the charged particles away, we have a series of strong magnets just below the optic. And so you can see the cavities and the labels here of these sweeping magnets put in. If you took that magnet off and measured it, you get something shown on the right here. Uh, this is a spatial representation of the magnetic field generated by the sweeping magnets. And pretty much every spacecraft, there's sensitivity for magnets. You don't like strong magnets. And this spacecraft is no different from that. And so you can see there's a couple of null points here or small points in the magnetic field. There should be four of them. Um, the bottom right one doesn't show up because of how it was sampled. But uh, ultimately, these were set up as a quadrupole to uh, minimize the uh, magnetic residue further away. And that's important because on a small set, you need to be measuring magnetic field and using it for avionics. And so that was implemented here. At the bottom is a micro channel plate. As we said, this is a little bit closer up photo of it. You can see the top grid um, helping, the, helping set up the high voltage um, lines here. All right, as we mentioned, it's, it's almost time to, to launch. The delivery is in um, maybe five or six weeks right now. That's early July. It'll be launching in September from um, California in the United States. Uh, the next mission that's planned to launch is called LEXI. This is going to be deployed on the lunar surface in fall 2023, at least scheduled right now, for a place um, near the equator called Mare Crisium. This is being developed through the NASA CLIPS program, and the lander itself will be developed by Firefly Aerospace, we call the Blue Ghost. The field of view of this is 9.1 by 9.1 degrees, a bigger focal length, and rather than one optic, it's nine optics, so you get a larger field of view. Uh, this is a, a collaboration between a number of organizations and led by Boston University here. This is the Lunar Environment Heliophysics X-ray Image. On the left is a CAD model of the telescope. The right is a modeled image, what you might expect to see with strong solar wind flux. And if you look at this, and if you're scientifically minded, you can see some 
positive and encouraging things. You see the magnetopause and you could track this as a function of time. The requirement for this mission is uh, a third of an RE for five minute cadence, I believe. Uh, there's strong heritage from this mission from a DLX rocket flight. We mentioned the successful DLX rockets before. This is a, a much of this flew as a piggyback on one of the rockets earlier. There's been a number of things added here as well. Uh, we'll highlight a couple of things that we talked about on the previous slides as well. Just like in Cupid, there needs to be um, a sweeping magnets as well as optics holders. Here we've got a tile of three by three optics. This is the magnet holder, sorry, the optics holder with no optics in it, and then one optic on the, the far right here, as well as the magnet, um, a model of the magnetic field that's implemented on this to keep charged particles out. And very similar to Cupid, it's a MCP detector, a microchannel plate detector. This is a potassium bromide coated detector for enhanced sensitivity in the band. This is a, a picture from a paper by Collier et al. And this is the, the full mechanical structure of this. It's, it's going through a number of developments right now, but you can see different sunshades and a deploy door on the top here. Uh, a feature of this is that uh, because it's on a lander and it's gonna be just sitting stationary on the moon, it actually has a fairly short mission that once the moon rotates and the lander is on the night side, that's the expected end of the mission. We don't expect to be able to continue or uh, revive once we get heated up again on the day side that the, the night side of the moon is so cold, it's unrecoverable. Uh, another fantastic mission coming up after Lexi will be the, the SMILE mission. And I'll highlight a soft X-ray imager being developed for that. This is, as we've moved from schedule, we've also moved in much bigger and bigger and bigger telescopes. You can see the optical assembly on the left in the CAD model. And there are many MPOs. I don't know if it looks like 32 MPOs. So we've gone from one to nine to 32. Uh, it's a, a much bigger instrument with a larger field of view of 15 by 26 degrees. It's a different detector system. This is two passively cooled CCDs. You can see those in the bottom left here. Uh, this is being led by Steve Sembe and the, the group at University of uh, Leicester in the UK in a collaboration with a whole bunch of groups as well. So some really great work by a number of groups. And the actual built unit is shown on the, the bottom right here going through a vibrational test. So it's a really impressive telescope that the group has developed. And so the target of this as well will be the magnetopause with some targeting of the cusp as well. And this mission is planned to launch and looks like this slide that was given to us by uh, Steve Sembe says 2024, so coming up soon. Uh, the last one we'll highlight is still in a phase A, so it's still in a competitive phase. We won't show too many pictures of it, but the STORM mission is a, a fantastic mission that will do a, a lot of global imaging of the magnetosphere. So allow us to answer a lot of those macro scale questions and system level questions of the magnetosphere and ionosphere system that we can't answer, we can't really understand, which is pinpoint measurements. Uh, the, the lead of this is David Seibeck and Michael Collier is the deputy principal investigator. There's a couple of in situ tools. Uh, there's a spectrometer, a plasma instrument, as well as magnetometer, as well as a fantastic array of imagers from FUV to ENA, um, as well as this uh, X-ray imager, a very large X-ray imager being led by Scott Porter at NASA Goddard. So right now this is in a phase A, but if things move forward and things are looking positive, then we'll have a plan launch in 2026 of this uh, great asset joining the community. So at that, I will end with my summary slide and, and the general message is that anywhere and everywhere high, high charge state solar wind plasma encounters neutrals, soft X-rays are emitted. And we can do fantastic things with this scientifically because of the gradients in solar wind plasma contacting the magnetosphere in the cusp and at the magnetopause. Uh, the next bullet is that for wide field of view imaging, the type of imaging we need to do to study the system of the magnetosphere rather than just elements of the magnetosphere, lobster eye optics are a fantastic tool to do this. It's something that's been developed over the last uh, 20 years or so, but in the last 10 or so years has really uh, accelerated in terms of feasibility and, and understanding the lab. And the future is bright. The future is very bright in soft x-rays. We have a whole bunch of missions coming on uh, just in the next couple of years. Uh, both being developed by the United States, as well as our friends in the UK and the Chinese Academy of Sciences as well. There's some really great missions coming up with some fantastic science results for people that are interested in studying system level physics. And I will end with a, a summary slide with some future references if people are interested in learning more. There's some great uh, broad papers covering this for um, magnetospheric application as well as uh, astrophysical and, and other. So I will end at that. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Ryan, for a wonderful talk. Um, we have a handful of questions uh, that I can start going through. 
Um, our first one comes from Jason Durr on slide 30. Oh boy, okay. So, Jason asks, the picture on slide 30 would presumably be an approximation for a smooth increase in medium density rather than a sharp boundary. Does this make much of a difference to the optical scattering considerations? Um, for example, the grazing incident reflections? Smooth increase. I'm not sure I understand. Um, so, I, I, yeah, Kyle, I don't know. What does smooth increase mean? He, um, this is a very idealized picture, and it just says the density changes on a, a snap of a finger. So it goes from vacuum to the medium. Yeah, that's what I take. Uh, um, Jason, do you want to clarify or? Yeah, so I mean, I understand the, the picture. The question is, since that picture is clearly an approximation to the real situation, which would have a smoother change between vacuum and medium where there's no sharp boundary, would that change the nature of the optical scattering in a way that's relevant for imaging? Yes. And what we, what we can infer from imaging, I guess. Uh, the answer is yes. And uh, I, I would say it's a secondary effect. So if you just wanted to, to get a rough idea, this is, this is pretty good. If you wanted to really understand it, and most people that study astrophysics do, you're gonna worry about that. And the thickness of coatings, multiple coatings, things like this are things that are considered greatly and um, carefully studied to optimize. So okay. it, it does make a difference and people are thinking about it. And, and there, there's quite a bit you can read about it as well using multi-layers of different, um, different materials on your reflector. I see. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, so next question comes from Jason Schuster uh, and it's regarding the kinetic uh, scale structures that are predicted on the bow shock in the magnetosphere. With global X-ray imagers, will you be able to resolve this kinetic structure or will they be blurred or integrated away by the processes kind of indicated on slide 21? So the larger scale, um, the larger macro scale processes. Uh, some of it will certainly be blurred. So the picture we're looking at right now, that nice slice from a, a beautiful simulation by Omidy and company, I don't think you would ever be able to see this. It's sufficiently far from the earth that the news source are low. And of course its structure is not, um, you're gonna get a blur because of the, the line of sight integration. Uh, so I wouldn't be optimistic about that. I would be optimistic about something like an HFA deforming the magnetopause because if you deform the magnetopause locally, you're gonna push it into a region where the neutral density is even larger as you get closer to the earth. And so you get more counts. And so you'll be able to resolve spatially even more. So things like a, a four shock bubble that slam that pass through the magneto sheath and slam into the magnetopause and deform it significantly. I think there's good hope that you'd be able to see things like that, but structures as they're forming out by the bow shock, uh, I'm not too optimistic for. Excellent. Um, so the next few questions, I'm not going to go through them in order because there's two or three that follow up with this question uh, quite nicely. Um, Ankush asks, how does the signal to noise ratio for the soft, soft X-ray imagers change with solar activity? Um, for example, CMEs or CIRs, and does this affect how much of the magnetopause you can um, image, for example, an MLT? Okay, so to the first one of does it change? Yes, yes, indeed. Of course, your your um, your intuition is exactly right. It does uh, as the flux in the solar wind changes, as the density and velocity change. Your um, soft X-ray signal will change, and there's plenty of examples of this. That if you go back in the literature and look at people that have used things like um, XMM Newton, when you have a CME, you have a much stronger, much brighter X-ray um, emission. Um, so how will it affect the MLT extent? Um, don't know exactly how to answer that. If you have a, a generally a CME, the structure itself is much larger than the magnetosphere. So if the whole thing slams into the magnetosphere, you generally get an enhancement uh, contacting the whole thing. If a structure is smaller, like an HFA or something, it likely won't compress the entire magnetosphere. It would just squeeze in a small portion of it. So 
if your magnetopause is squeezed in enough, you could certainly see MLT asymmetries. Cool. Um, so the next one is from Suman. Um, what, should, what would be the ideal time resolution for the global X-ray imagers? Um, you had mentioned that they measure X-ray photon counts instead of the integration time. Uh, so in order to correctly identify kinetic scale or kinetic structures on the Bauschock and magnetopause uh, and distinguish between continuous or patchy reconnection, uh, what, re what temporal resolutions do you think you'd need? Sure, I, I think this is a, a great comment. And you oftentimes talk about the science traceability matrix that you start with a science question you're interested in and then start flowing into the tools necessary and the observations necessary. So in that philosophy, we can start with the physics we're interested in. And we think FDEs often occur with periodicity of um, four or five, uh, maybe I'm saying the wrong number, is it seven? Well, I'll have to double check my, my literature, but there's been some good statistical work about um, periodicity of FDEs and we'll say, um, I think it's about five minutes. And so you would want to be able to image a little bit better than five minutes if you would want to be able to see uh, those FTEs snipping magnetic flux off and pushing the boundary inward periodically. Excellent. Uh, so Jason follows up uh, kind of with a similar cam uh, question. Um, with these imagers, will they be giving kind of screenshots of the magnetosphere or can we think of them like global magnetosphere X-ray cameras taking a movie of the emissions? Screenshots versus camera. Um, I, I have a little bit of trouble differentiating those myself, but it's, it's a different realm for us to think about things in terms of event rather than images. And it's hard to sometimes get your mind about that initially, but that's really the way you should think about it. And anytime anything more exciting happens, you can probably get better time resolution. So think about, you might be most excited about compression during a CME, great. CMEs are very dense and they compress the magnetopause in a lot. And so you're gonna get a lot of counts because it compresses into an area of higher neutral density and the solar wind structure has high density. And so everything's in your favor if you wanna study CMEs because you'll get higher time and spatial resolution. And you get to pick the, the interplay between the two because you can integrate um, with smaller pixels if you integrate for longer, or you can integrate with higher time resolution if you integrate um, bigger pixels. So it, it's, a, it's a constant trade by the user about how they want to learn about the system. Cool. Uh, so our final question comes from Eric um, and it's regarding slide 41. Uh, mm -hmm. What type of gases are typically used in the proportional counters? And do you need to mitigate any chemistry that might be going on when the gas gets ionized? Mm. So I, I personally haven't worked with proportional counters, so I would point you to some of the papers in the bottom left here by uh, Massimiliano Galazzi uh, and Nick Thomas about this, as well as some of the work by um, Dan McCannon that's uh, cited there about the parts. But it's very similar to a Geiger counter. The one difference is usually the voltage use that you don't set it so it saturates. Geiger counters will often saturate. Excellent. Uh, so that's all the questions. I do have one more though. Uh, with Cupid and Lexi being launched, will that data be available for everyone to start looking at these images of the cusp and the magnetosphere or magnetopause? Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks for asking. Yeah, the, the data will be publicly available and there will be software analysis tools as well. I know a lot of people in the space sciences community don't often use X-ray data. And so there will be Python made software tools uh, hopefully with speedos plugins that will allow people to just ingest the data and make images at different time and spatial resolutions they pick. Ah, excellent. That sounds great. Um, oh, I just had one more question pop up again from Suman. Um, oh, no, sorry, just a comment saying thank you for your answer. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so thanks again, Brian, for a wonderful talk. Um, we will be continuing the series uh, next week and we'll be moving into, or no, sorry, not quite yet. Uh, Jacob Bortnick will be talking about machine learning and magnetospheric physics next week. And then following Jacob's talk, we'll be starting to move into space weather focused talks up until about the beginning of JAM and middle of summer. Uh, so thank you again, Brian. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Have a wonderful week, everyone.